If you heard me speak yesterday, I feel like I should give you some swag for, for coming again. Thank you so much. This is a, a very different talk. This is a regular old artist talk called Nothing Personal. And I will be answering the following frequently asked questions. Where do you get your ideas? How do you make your work? What is your creative process? There will be a brief digression into beauty. And when I was looking at the PowerPoint this morning, I saw that I put the same slide that I didn't read in yesterday's lecture into this lecture. So I'll read it today. Why is your work so depressing? And why glass? All right. And um, in the background is a slide of everything I ever made. So we can all go home now. <clears throat> All right, so where do you get your ideas? I get that question all the time. It's sort of, I think every artist gets that question. The problem with that question is it's, uh, there's no place one goes to get ideas. You can't go to the idea store. I don't have uh, an idea and then it pops out like that. <clears throat> In fact, I don't have ideas at all. I have, um, drawings. And I, I think I started to think about the word draw not that long ago. And I thought, well, that's it's an interesting word because it means to pull. And that's how I feel when I'm drawing is that I am literally pulling ideas out of me. <clears throat> so I don't see a picture in my head and draw it, even though these things are ostensibly from my imagination. Like if I if you were to say to me, hey, Judith, what's in your imagination right now? The answer is nothing. I'm inventing and discovering as I go. The images literally generate themselves on the page, kind of like the surrealist did automatic uh, drawing. So a lot of times I, I scribble and then I turn it into something. But I tend to draw faces and flowers and little creatures. I do uh, much better in drawing if I'm very, very distracted. And it turns out that the best form of distraction is faculty meetings. So I do a lot of drawings in faculty meetings. And then I input them into Photoshop. That's a, I uh, didn't have a computer because <laughs> I'm 57 for most of my life. But I used to do this with Xerox machines. Anyway, now I put things into Photoshop and I clean them up kind of like you see here. So they would look like this on a page, and then I would put them into sheets, and then I turn them into pieces. So that is an example of that. <clears throat> um, this is some notes from an inclusivity workshop. I decided to include some flowers. I do listen. Um, in fact, I think I sort of hinted yesterday, I can't listen unless I'm moving my hands around quite quickly. Uh, otherwise, I start to daydream. This is what sort of anchors me into a situation. <clears throat> I draw a lot of flowers, and uh, sometimes I organize them into large stained glass windows, such as this one. This, uh, this is one of the largest stained glass windows I ever made, and I'll tell you a little story about it. I, uh, I designed it to be big because it was going to be the most fun I ever had making a piece, which uh, reminds me of an old saying that if you want God to laugh, tell him you have plans. So this was the most unfun piece I ever made. And it was big, a big unfun experience. But I'm happy with how it came out. Here's some details. <clears throat> Lots of loving details. All right, the second way I get my ideas is by stealing them. And I have a few examples of that. The King of Maggots on the right is the first piece I made after graduating from college. And it doesn't have any sandblasting in it because um, when I did finally set up my first studio, it was literally a window sash that I had trash picked and put some bricks and a light bulb underneath it for a light table and a really small wax burnout kiln that I was going to fire glass paint in it cost $75. I just priced it for my assistant, and uh, it was like $750 now. I can't believe how much it's gone up in uh, 30 years, quite a bit, for a tiny little kiln with an 8-inch chamber. 
So I used that kiln for many, many, many years, like 15 years. Nothing could be bigger than this. Here's another example of stealing. On the right is a window from a church in England called Tattersall Holy Trinity, and a, sort of an interesting historic aside. A lot of the stained glass windows in England were smashed during the Protestant Reformation, and they would just put the glass scraps, uh, I don't know, somewhere. They didn't haul them away to the dump or anything. They were still on the grounds of the church, maybe supposedly buried in the graveyard. And uh, I guess they, uh, they would undig them and remake the windows because they didn't have like a board up service. So if you're, you smash out the windows in a church, you're just gonna have a big hole in your church. So they rebuilt the windows, but they often did not build them the way they used to be. So you'll get like this freaky collage postmodernist word salad and stuff like that. I think that is a really cool window. And I used it as the basis for that piece on the left, which is called Self-Portrait of Someone Else. <clears throat> Um, I like to steal memes. Um, before memes were things on the internet with text on them, they were uh, used to refer to a unit of cultural transference. So sort of like trends, visual trends. So this, these are three images from uh, women running from houses, blogspot.com. Um, and here's my version. This is an older piece from the early 1990s. Here's a piece on the bottom called Jazz Funeral for Dee Dee. And on top, this is a piece of uh, Russian folk. I think it's sort of a political cartoon, but of, it's folk art. Um, I generated this window by uh, making three lino cuts of mice and putting glass paint on them and sort of squishing them down. And you can see the sort of the capillary action in the, in the mouse bodies, like, like that. Whoops, next. <clears throat> and then I stole from Japanese prints because I remember from art history that that's what you're supposed to do when you're an artist. And this piece, this is one of my favorite pieces. This is from the early 2000s, and it's called Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. And this was inspired by two pieces. The bottom is by Hokusai, and the top is by Masami Terioka, and they're both called Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. Mine is the sort of cleaned up version. One thing to note is that this drawing, this is a stained glass window, but the drawing for the ocean, which was a separate drawing from the figure and from the octopus, was uh, a tile, meaning that it, if you could form it into a tube, it continued basically forever. So the, the lines of the ocean would connect if you could bend this stained glass window into a tube. And that is one octopus, not two. So if, if you were to take those panels apart and reformat them, you would have a panel of a girl with little tentacles on the sides and a whole octopus. <clears throat> it was also inspired, I think, by, by the movie Breaking the Waves by Lars von Trier, a movie a lot of people really hate a lot. All right, so I had this crazy mystical experience when using the toilet, I, uh, and I was able to document it with my old Polaroid. I was sitting on the toilet and I saw this, and I realized that it was Christina's world. See, I've diagrammed it out here for you. There's the figure of Christina as the toothpaste, and the two houses, and this thing is here is the sink. This really uh, affected me greatly. In fact, I love the piece, Christina's Worlds. Uh, a lot of times, people uh, also find this, uh, like loving Andrew Wyeth, it's not like the coolest thing to do when you're in art school, but I can't stop it. So I did a piece based on Christina's World, where instead of having um, polio, she has uh, frontal lobe seizures. Now, a lot of my ideas seem to be mashups of things. So for instance, this magazine cover, which is commemorating the uh, lost at sea during World War I, and a performing seal combined to make this piece. And there's a, a picture of her head 
you know, the glass is like this big. It's kind of cool to see it that big. Michelangelo's Pieta, mashed up with the Lady in the Unicorn Tapestry, became this piece. One of my inspirations for this piece was I really wanted to do a big, dead pink unicorn and see if I could get away with it. At some point, I found a website that had archived every single cover from this French, actually, I think it might not be French. It's French, but it might be from Vietnam, um, tabloid called Le Petit Journal, which was, it was kind of like the weekly world news, only with these fantastic illustrations. So I decided that my work was over in terms of ever having to think of an idea ever again. I was just going to redo Le Petit Journal covers for the rest of my life, only turn the, all the characters into women. So there's one of them. And this is called The Floor, because I ran out of titles that day. And here on the left is a sketch uh, based on the image on the right. Um, this has a, a kind of a, a twisted story behind it. So first of all, I did this pencil sketch of this uh, character based on this magazine cover. I had the idea that I wanted to do a pile of skulls because of all these images of piles of skulls that are really cool. So in order to generate that image, um, I, knew, I know how to, or I knew, I used to know how to do 3D computer modeling with Maya software, but I haven't done it in a really long time, so I bet I don't know how to do it anymore. I made one skull and uh, duplicated it a million times and squished them together so that I could draw a pile of skulls, which is how all medieval artisans did stained glass windows. Ultimately, I separated the female character from the pile of skulls and made two windows. I felt that, the, um, that this image was a little too didactic, politically speaking. Like, it's, it was intended to be an anti-war statement and I felt like you don't need to like, you know, really bash people over the head with the, with the meaning of the work. I was really pleased with this composition because um, one weird thing to note about my work is that I never crop figures. For me to crop a figure at the mid-calf is to, it's really, there can't be a person there. It's like chopped off legs. It's completely, uh, um, uh, a disgusting, creepy thing to me. I'm a, I have some sort of object permanence issue. And also, I like the idea of putting the heads on the bottom and the feet on top. So this seemed to me to be a, a more appropriate statement about the horrors of war than I could possibly think of. And it's called Monument because, um, well, I mean, for obvious reasons, but I also got the idea from a song which had a line in it I stand upon this stupid platform that I made with my own hands. And that seemed fitting. All right, so here's this painting, this famous Trompe Dutch still life painting, which I admire very much. And on the left, we have Peel's Museum, which hangs at the Pennsylvania Academy Museum. Everyone has to look at it all the time. And on the right is the Papist Pyramid of Snakes, which is a political cartoon against Catholicism. And all of that combined to make this window. That I became, and if you saw me yesterday morning, I was wearing a skirt with this snake pattern on it. Because in my mind now, this is a recent piece from 2013. If I'm going to design a design like this, it has to be a repeating pattern. I'm not going to bother to do something that can't also be turned into wallpaper and fabric. Not, But I have never... I need it like I can I need someone to tell me how to like figure all that out. I know that you can go on the internet and do it, but I don't uh, have the brain to uh, to do it myself. Now I know um, this is sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but I, I figure if you're glass people, you're going like, how did she make that? So there are basically color separations, and I'll be going into the techniques in detail. But that's what the color separations of glass look like separated. And when you put them together, they look like this. There is nothing else. That's it. Um, Odalisque. There, the, um, there's this tradition that 
feminists like myself find somewhat odious of displaying women like this for men to get their yayas off. So I wanted to do one. It had to have a curtain, it had to have flowers, and it had to have turquoise in it because I thought that those uh, two paintings kind of had all of those elements. <clears throat> and that's a close-up. Now, I think it's a weird time to be a figurative artist. I think it's, I think it's always difficult to be a figurative artist. Um, I read all the articles that came out about uh, Donna Schutz and her painting of Emmett Till. And uh, I think besides the, uh, the reasons for the controversy of that painting, I think basically if you do human figures, you're probably going to upset somebody because just by turning it into art, you are automatically um, objectifying and it's very easy to see it as exploitation. Um, but I wanna say that if artists back off from figuration, the appetite to see human figures is so great that that will mean that the only people doing human figures are advertisers and pornographers, and that will stink. And just here's the evidence that like we are going to look at human figures no matter what. Monkeys would rather look at porn than drink cherry juice. Uh, isn't that amazing? Yes, no, class, hello. I think that's amazing. And they also, given a choice between cherry juice or popular female monkeys. They want to look at the celebrities. So that explains People Magazine, in case you were really searching in your soul this morning for a reason for People Magazine. We just like looking at celebrities. <clears throat> Here's another mashup. What happens when you mix the story of Odysseus lashing himself to the mass of, mast of his boat to avoid the uh, being tempted by the sirens, combined with the fields of deadly poppies from the Wizard of Oz, you get this piece. But I have to tell you, first of all, this piece is so tiny. It's like this big. <clears throat> this piece, that, that explanation of this piece came with hindsight. I got, sometimes people ask me like, why did you draw that picture? What does it mean? And uh, for many, many years, I sort of refused to answer that question, but um, they wore me down. And eventually, I, I, I learned to answer the questions better. So the observation that it was about Odysseus lashing himself to the mass, mast of a boat to avoid the deadly poppies came with hindsight. <clears throat> Initially, I was just inspired by my rather vast collection of people tied to horses which is a very vast collection indeed. I, uh, I collect images like nobody's business, and then I try to organize them in my hard drive and get in trouble. So those top flowers, they're only like a quarter of an inch. I was really in the zone when I made this piece. It was a, a great feeling. <clears throat> so what idea did I steal for this piece, which is called The Life Ecstatic? This is based on the Google map pin. And uh, this is where I live in Philadelphia. And this is the recommended Vietnamese restaurant, but they're all delicious. You cannot go wrong. Um, <clears throat> earlier this last year, I don't know, sometime within the past 12 months, I started to make some very traditional pieces based on uh, black and white and silver stain rondelles. But the image in the middle was based on this image, which is called uh, the, the Book of Miracles. It's an old text. It's, uh, I think it looks really contemporary, actually. But I believe that it's, it's uh, Baroque, Renaissance. It's not Gothic. And there's a close-up. I added the ship. All right, so the second question I get all the time is how do I make the work, like technically? So one of the, the main ways I work with glass is to use flash glass. Now, do you guys all know what flash glass is? No, okay, good, I will explain. Flash glass is characterized 
by having a very thin veneer of extremely bright color on top of a base layer that's a lighter color, like clear, for example. Uh, and this is flat glass made for stained glass artists, hand blown, usually in Europe. <clears throat> and you can carve into that surface using tools like a sandblaster, a flexible shaft engraver, and things like that. And I use the flash glass. <clears throat> Actually, when people are, are not artists at all, I say that it's like engraving a cameo, and usually, like, lights go off in their eyes. It's like, that's not exactly a parallel, <laughs> but it's close enough. So I'm engraving these images more than painting them. And in some cases, um, I use the glass like a color separation. So this section here is all th these three pieces of glass piled on top of each other. This is red on clear, and this is blue on clear, and this is pink on clear. And the pink on clear has yellow paint on it, and these two have black paint on it, which the yellow paint is actually oil paint, and this is black vitreous paint that fires on in a kiln. Probably the biggest mistake is to assume that I worked from a color sketch. I don't even think I worked from a black and white sketch. I had a sketch for the figure, but not for the rest of that room. I just sort of wing it and hope that it comes out half decent, which actually is a really excellent strategy for making art because then you have lower expectations and you tend to be delighted by what happens. If I had a set way that it had to be, I would probably be disappointed. Here's another example where I got really very specific about using the glass as color separation. So this chandelier here, I took a picture of a chandelier. I didn't take the photo. I found it on the internet. And a nice high res image. And in Photoshop, I put the saturation up all the way. And then I made three photos um, uh, negatives of the CMYK layers, which I reproduced in glass, and it came out like that. I did that with oil paints, not with flash glass. So that window has to be in a light box. Uh, the central figure here, this is it taken apart. So this is blue on clear flash glass. And what I generally do, and I will tell you this again in painstaking detail, is I sandblast it first, and then I go into it with hand tools. And this is red on clear, and when you stack them together, you get this. So that's what it looks like together, and that's a part. And this piece, called Feral Child, this section here, I will show you in stages. So this is the red and the blue glass having just been sandblasted. And here it is having been worked with flexible shaft engravers, and which if you um, don't know, that's basically a dentist drill. And uh, <clears throat> also with hand files. And if you come to the demo, I'll show you how it's done actually. And so these are the two pieces together. The red, whoops, the red piece has glass paint on it and silver stain. Silver stain is a, um, a mixture of silver nitrate and gamboge that you paint on the glass and you fire it on in an oven at about 1,000 degrees and it stains the glass yellow. That is the origin of the term stained glass. If it doesn't have yellow stain on it, it's not stained glass. And when you put them together, they look like this. Here's her head. I took a lot of flack on the internet because the uh, wolf's tongue is on top of her head. And apparently if you skin a wolf and stick your head through the jaw, the tongue would be on the bottom. So, oops, now you know. Don't tell anyone. Here are the three layers separated. So I do most of the work on the red glass, which uh, I guess in ceramics, red glaze is really fugitive and hard to work with. But for whatever reason, I find the red flash glass to be extremely predictable and stable. So I know exactly what's going to happen in the kiln, and that's very nice. 
So I usually put most of the paint on the red. The blue and the pink are just carved into. Oh, and I painted the nose on the blue. So this piece is called Fleeing Foxes. You can see there's some foxes down there. There they are. And the foxes are all on blue glass. You can see I've put red glass on top and they're like these streaks on the wolf's face. That's from sandblasting the red glass a teeny tiny little bit. I mean, really little. So that's what the engraving looked like at the beginning. And uh, this is what it looked like all the way done. This is why I got a repetitive strain injury to my wrist this summer. This is crazy hard work. Something uh, like that takes weeks to do. It takes at least, like to make one inch, one square inch look really nice can take like up to an hour. <clears throat> Here's a piece called New Ghost. Um, the bottom part was something I've always wanted to do. Uh, the image of a city from uh, an airplane, basically. That's Berlin. This, that has absolutely no significance to the piece in my mind, it might in yours. I needed the highest res aerial photograph that I could find in order to create this and, uh, on the internet, and that's the one I found happened to, that was nice looking, was Berlin. So she's floating above Berlin. And I, I just want to say one last thing. I felt like I really nailed it by making it glow on the horizon. That was sort of a midnight decision. So here's the piece at three different stages of engraving. I remember it took about a week to do the full engraving. It's about 18 inches by 12 or 14, something like that, maybe a little smaller. It took a long time. One thing I'll say about engraving into glass, it didn't occur to me when I, when I started doing it, but the glass doesn't come back if you engrave it off. So you have to have um, nerves of steel. And you know, I'll like you know, I'll pace around a lot to work out my courage to do this because you one false move and you get to start over again. It's really nerve wracking. I love that. <clears throat> that was funny. Okay, this Google Map pin. I will show you the middle part in detail now, and the figure too. The figure is just engraved into this beautiful blue French antique. The blue glass engraves better than the red glass for some reason. So I have the blue glass, the flowers on that red thing are the same exact color as the figure. They're just on top of pieces of red glass. So that's them after the first sandblasting. And here I have engraved into the red a little bit. And here I've engraved, fully engraved the, both the red and the blue. And here I've added the yellow silver stain. And here I've added pink. The pink is probably oil paint. I can use pink enamel, but I, it's not as pretty, which makes me crazy. The flanking the Google map pin is uh, these sections of uh, here that look like this. That's what they look like without green glass on them. So it's just an engraving into blue. And that's what it looks like with the green and a layer of red on it. So it's three layers deep. And that's the a section of the piece together. Now I'm going to talk about this section here and this section here. This is called three-tiered cosmos. A lot of cosmologies deal with there being a normal world, an underworld, and an overworld. You know, a sort of middle hell and heaven. So that's the top section while it was in progress. So it's blue flash glass with red flash glass on top of it. And I have removed from the red almost all the color except for where the birds are. And I've done very heavy engraving and sandblasting and painting, silver stain, all that stuff. This is the blue layer when it was finished but not together. And that is pink enamel. I'm pretty positive of that. There it is together. 
And here's the fish section. The fish section was so much fun. <clears throat> I got to design fish. I don't usually think about fish. I'm always thinking about birds. Anyway, so that's the blue glass. And that's the red. And there was a layer of pink. This pink flash glass, I got out of jury duty because this company called the SOG decided to stop producing flash glass. And I had jury duty and I, when I found out. And I told the judge that I had to go to Brooklyn and buy a full crate of gold pink on clear flash glass the next day before anyone else got it. So I have it all. Um, I have very little of it left. But he did, he let me out of jury duty for that. I thought that was excellent. That's the fish in progress. And this is the birds done and the fish done. All right, that is the end of how I use flash glass like color separations. Here is a brief section on how I use flash glass more spontaneously without having any, without caring how it goes together basically. And a lot of that has to do with the backgrounds of the pieces. I make these images that you can mix and match. So I don't have any set way of putting these things together. And seeing how they interact is really exciting. I love color. That's my thing as an artist. All right, I also paint on glass. I don't do traditional uh, matting and tracing painting, although I have seen a lot of demos at this point on it. I tried it once and it came out really bad. I generally sandblast the glass and I if I want to be very true to the drawing, I will then take the sandblasted glass and put it on top of the drawing and trace with a Sharpie. And then I will rub glass paint into the sandblasting. And you can see, so I have cut out a, a stencil, the sandblast, that's only the silhouette of these figures. And I have rubbed glass paint into it to make them gray. And then I have painted the magic marker lines with glass paint, and then I fire it. And then I go into it and I start doing things with files and I paint it some more and I go back and forth. I like to do a lot of firings. You know, you find in stained glass uh, Facebook groups, there's a lot of like, yeah, I did like 10 mats without having to do more than one firing. And uh, that's sort of some sort of uh, macho badge of amazingness. It's really good for the environment, but it's really bad for ADD. I like doing 20 firings because every time I'm done and something's in the kiln, I get to go surf the net. So it works for me. Um, and I work the paint the same way I do the flash glass. Once it's fired on, I use engraving tools to get highlights. With these figures, in the background of the figures, I painted um, a matte painting. A matte painting is you take a bunch of glass paint, you mix it up, it's really easy. There is a lot of mystery surrounding glass paint, but the fact is, is it's actually idiot proof. You mix it with water, you paint it on the glass, you fire it, and voila, something happened. <clears throat> a matte, you paint, make the paint really thin and you put it on the glass and you take this very expensive paintbrush called a badger and you blend it out evenly. And then when it's dry, you squirt it with Windex or water or something, and you then get out a hair dryer and dry the bubbles. And when it's completely dry, you take that Badger blender brush and you go over the surface, and everything that was a, a bubble from the spray goes away. And you get these really freaky psychedelic designs, which are really cool. And that's the piece finished. I did. I, I had a sculpture phase. I'll tell you the truth. All I wanted was to turn into Sibylla Peretti. I, I would have been happy if I could just have been her. But I, um, I showed her this work, and she was, thank God, she, she, she was like looking at me like, you're crazy? It's not like mine. <laughs> I don't know if I upset her or not. I hope not. I love Sibylla. But I totally admire her work and would be really happy if I could just make stuff that looked like hers. <clears throat> um, I made this crucified naked male cow. Um, if you're a student and you want to sell your work, I advise you to never make a naked crucified male cow. 
It's probably the least sellable thing ever. Um, <clears throat> I'm not even able to give the damn thing away. No, it's my favorite thing that I made. I like it. And better than how, this is cast bullseye. It really, really in person, it looks exactly like painted wood, which galls me because it's about this big and it weighs like, you know, 40 pounds. It's definitely glass. It broke in two places. It's been repaired. It weighs a ton. I had to consult with Dan Clayman on how to make a French cleat. And, um, but it looks like wood. And um, it especially looked good while being made. <laughs> I, I had made this, like I totally rigged up my sink and was using like these bar floor mats to protect it. And <clears throat> I have to cover my castings with black magic marker because when you're, I, I was not satisfied with the way they looked at when they came out of the kiln. But more than that, I was not satisfied with the fact that I hadn't gotten my jollies off carving into something for hours and hours on end. So I bought like a, um, a rubber suit from Amazon and turned my studio into a carving studio and I carved a lot of detail into the surfaces. But in order to see what I was doing, I had to cover them with black magic marker first because you can't see when you're engraving glass. This is the craziest thing because water's going all over the surface, which diffuses the light and refracts it. It's like, I, I have nothing but admiration for that. All right, so my next question that I get a lot is how do you, well, I don't really get this question a lot, but I think people are trying to ask it, which is, how do you take some sort of initial seed of something and turn it into an idea? And this is my actual studio. These are the bulk failure boxes underneath my work table. I will say I have no idea of what I want to make when I start. I don't start with a full drawing. I, sometimes I make these figures in glass and I put them in Tupperware containers, sometimes for years. And uh, I wait for them to speak to me. They used to speak to me more when I smoked cigarettes because you could sit there and like do this and they would talk. But now I haven't smoked in a very long time so I have to chew gum and hope that they talk to me. It's not quite the same effect. However, I don't wanna force any conclusion onto a piece. I want the idea to arise organically and that means sometimes I have to wait. It also means that I change my mind a lot. I made this piece twice. Um, this piece here, I made the figure three times, actually four times before I was satisfied, and I assembled them as small studies. Sometimes I just have to trash it, but that's what the piece looked like when it was finished. I just couldn't get happy with it. And this piece, which is down, the final piece is here. I worked to resolve it many times in glass. This is the kind of thing you'll find in my bulk failure box. I, I did assemble this one ultimately also. So I ended up making two pieces. It can be a really agonizing process, although I actually don't mind that. I don't, uh, like, the, the, probably the hardest thing as an artist is that there's no assurance that this thing is gonna, that I'm gonna pull it off, basically. And if you think that I don't sit there and worry about that, you are wrong. And my, loved ones have to listen to me and they always say like but you always do manage to make something and finish it and be happy with it why is this one the time that you're never ever ever going to be able to do it and it's like i can't explain it to people but i i have i just have no sense that i'm going to be able to do it and it can be really terrifying but i just keep going <clears throat> And that's what the piece looks like when it was done and Corning bought it. That was quite satisfying. <laughs> so it has a nice conclusion. Um, this piece on the top is called Sin Eater. And here's some of the sort of insane lengths I was going to to assemble this piece. Um, I have it in this section to show you that this is what it looked like on Friday night. By Sunday, I had smashed that out with a hammer. If you've ever taken a stained glass window apart, I can tell you it's like sticking your hand down a garbage disposal and turning it on. The easiest way to unassemble a stained glass window is to smash it. So I just smashed the upper right-hand corner and reworked it here again so you can see. And this is what it looks like with reflected light. 
yesterday, if you were at the talk yesterday, I was talking about the idea of sacrifice. And I, it would be perfectly possible for me to make that whole section without cutting any glass at all. But that, to me, would be to, to basically, it just, it just doesn't sit right with me. I want this to be an effort. See, this is the, the parts <clears throat> in cereal bowls. I wanted it to be as awful an effort as humanly possible. <laughs> so anyway, and here's some source material from my men crawling on all fours section of my hard drive. And I also did a fancy pencil drawing for that one. I don't always do that, but when I do, I use number 2B pencils. So in addition to being the ideal way of expressing my um, perfectionism, my work also lets me show off my more spontaneous side. So this piece, which is called Anchoress, um, is, this whole section is improvised. And this is a... Um, Gothic manuscript image of an anchorite. The anchorites were um, mystics who basically volunteered to have themselves bricked up in walls uh, and die. So the top part of this window, this was the sketch for it. And this is what the glass looked like. The reason I, uh, I and there's gaps in it, like I want to leave room to improvise because the older I get, the more I want to improvise. So I'm trying to create, that's why that giant flower thing was supposed to be so much fun. Um, because improvising is fun when it is fun. When it's not fun, it's not fun. That's what I found out. Anyway, so here's what the three pieces of glass look like separated. Um, just so you can see here, the blue piece broke. Glass breaks. That's a horrible fact. <clears throat> and there's the figure. So here's my brief digression into beauty, and this is what I didn't read yesterday. The question of whether beauty is in the world or within us, in other words, the question as to whether beauty is in the object or in the eye of the beholder, has been tossed back and forth over the ages. It is a question that ultimately collapses on itself. The question presupposes that the world of objects and that the perceiver of objects are separate entities. We have to choose between beauty being in one or the other. One of the lessons of evolutionary psychology, as we shall see in greater detail later, is that we are deeply integrated with the natural world. Our mind has been sculpted by nature and it is tightly coupled to the environment. We cannot ask questions about the structure of our minds without bumping into properties of the world. The question of whether beauty lies in the world or in our heads might be reframed as follows. What in the coupling of mind and world gives us the experience of beauty? Now, <clears throat> I think this might be quite presumptuous of me, but I think of my work as beautiful. And so I got very interested in reading about beauty, and I came to understand that, of course, artists had been told that the job of an artist was to manufacture beautiful things for many, many generations. Not that many. When you actually look at Western European art history, it's not that long, but a few hundred years. And they were, in, in some ways, they were really sick and tired of having that mandate jammed down their throat, so they were keen to rebel against it. But there were other factors going on, such as World Wars I and II, that made the pleasure of beauty seem very indulgent, escapist, and insulting. It separated beauty from the truth, in other words. Identity politics has pointed out, rightfully so, even though despite what I said about Maybelline yesterday, that beauty can be a form of oppression. It can be, it's not always. So I think that we struggle between our mind and our body to understand whether beauty is good for us, like spinach. Is it moral or is it good for us like candy, because candy makes me happy now. <laughs> I think the origins are pretty personal. I always felt really ugly as a little girl. I remember asking one of my grandmother, my grandmother Thompson, if I was pretty, and she said, pretty is as pretty does, which is like saying to a little girl, you're ugly. 
So I was really concerned. I got teased for my looks a lot when I was in school. Anyway, now that I'm much more secure and over 50 and not sure if I care anymore so much, I'm willing to go to a website that you put little pointers on your face and analyze mathematically how good looking you are and I actually not completely die. I will tell you, I was astounded to be as high as a 5.35. I was, I mean, I was delighted. I could not believe it, especially with that particularly nasty photo of myself. So, um, <clears throat> my belief has always been that if I couldn't seduce people with me and my body and my face, then maybe I could have my artwork do it for me. <clears throat> so I'm always trying to make it as beautiful as possible. And I think when my painting teacher had told me over and over again how beauty was unimportant, I, as a female, thought, easy for you to say, but it's not true for me. Beauty is really important for a female, whether you like it or not, whether it's a social construction or not. You, you, like, women who wear makeup are considered more trustworthy in job interviews. There's the sketch for that. <clears throat> but it's one thing to say that I'm interested in beauty because I felt totally inadequate. Um, <clears throat> but I also had the intuition that I wanted to work with subject matter that would be very ugly. And that if I wanted people to love the work, and I will admit that I did want that, there had to be some sort of payoff. So there had to be some sort of pleasure in looking at my work. And that brings me to the next question. Why is your work so depressing? And the only people that will ask this are family members. But I know other people think it. So I will say I find that question odd because I've never seen any art where the people weren't happy before. Never, none. It's never happened. I have no clue why anyone might like something that wasn't totally happy. And in my defense, I will say, yes, I have made a lot of sad faces. And I've made a lot of agonized faces. And I've made a lot of faces of ennui, people who don't seem to care what's happening to them. And I've made a lot of neutral faces. And I've made a lot of ecstatic faces. So it's not like I'm all depresso all the time. I really find that question, it really get, um, strikes a nerve with me. Because I think the world is such a depressing place that I have zero interest in adding to the gross national depresso quotient. I, I, am, I truly believe the dopey idea that art should be uplifting. And I believe that my art is uplifting, which might be completely crazy. <clears throat> um, I think when I was little, I think I was, I was pretty depressed as a little girl. My mother used to tell me to cheer up a lot. I don't think that that's helpful. I don't remember ever saying, oh, what a good idea. I think I'll go cheer up. So I assume that like when you're talking to someone who is in despair, that you have to speak their language at their level. So in terms of being uplifting, it doesn't make sense to just shove a vase of flowers in someone's face and tell them to cheer up. <clears throat> so. There is that. So my philosophy, I'm proud to say, is a, basically a sort of a third grade level philosophy, is that one thing an artist does is take negative energy and converts it into something potable. This is a sewage treatment plant, just like me. <laughs> Thank God someone laughed. Um, <laughs> so that's one thing I think art can do. It teaches you how to process your negative feelings by, by looking at it. And if you are a maker, it teaches you how to process negative feelings by making the thing. So art is a safe place to rehearse real life situations that you need to practice. It's a safe place to um, do things that are socially unacceptable. And it's a safe place to deal with your negative feelings. 
I don't think anyone needs to learn how to cope with their horrible, terrible abundance of happiness. What I do think people need to learn is how to make their suffering meaningful. And although I made uh, a big deal yesterday about how I'm definitely not a Christian, I do think that the origins of Christian art were sort of attempting to, to deal with that. Whether they do or not is another story. So I've been asked over and over and over again if my work is self-portraits. And obviously, they're not intended to be pictures of my physical self. Um, yesterday, I talked about dolls. I think of these as dolls. And in preparation for this lecture, I googled doll play, but I didn't find what I was looking for because it was really the zero hour with these lectures. But what I was interested in was finding references to using dolls like, like when um, the police say, where did he hurt you on this dolly, that kind of thing, or even using dolls to cast magic spells or using the use of effigies in rituals of sympathetic magic. That was the sort of doll thing I was interested in researching because I wanted to, because I think that's how I use the figures in my work. So as I said yesterday, my dolls in my piece, and they are doll scale, by the way, uh, is a way of creating characters to stand in my place and absorb my bad feelings and my trauma so I don't have to. They're like absorbent sponges. <clears throat> um, this is Persephone, who is pulling a flower down. It's actually based on a poem where she says, send flowers because when I pull them down from the surface, all the petals fall off. <clears throat> And this is a very recent piece called The Florist. And here's a close up. So uh, The Florist, this piece was, she was originally gonna have a background of something completely different. It just came together that she was drooping and all these flowers were drooping and it really worked. Um, so I'll show you the layers apart, back to technique. So this piece here is these two layers. This piece here is these two layers, etc. So you get the idea of how that's done. I was really happy to do a glass joke in glass. <clears throat> I'm gonna go a little faster. Um, this section here of this piece, um, it's there. I thought uh, th that was sort of the apotheosis of this flower imagery for me. It's two layers of glass again. <clears throat> And this is a piece I did recently. It's, uh, I think the medieval and Renaissance artists always look forward to getting a commission to do The Temptation of St. Anthony. If you don't know all the paintings of The Temptation of St. Anthony, you should Google it because it was clearly an excuse to do sci-fi fantasy art and really indulge your uh, um, urges to make crazy little monsters. The original title for this was, um, and uh, apologies for getting political, but the original title was uh, the Trump uh, victory plate for 2016. Um, <clears throat> and one last thing I wanted to say about beauty and the use of the images as sort of effigies is the idea of empathy, which I brought up yesterday a little bit. And <clears throat> I think that the apotheosis of our humanity is, when it works, is our ability to connect empathically for others. And I think that one main expression of that is through art. So I showed this piece yesterday in, when I was talking about the same thing. I didn't talk about the inspiration. The inspiration of this piece is the lion hunt of Ashurbanipal, which is at the... Um, uh, British Museum. And it's a whole room and it's basically, here's another image from it. It's, um, I've seen it many times now. It's one of my favorite works of art ever. And apparently I've, you know, the first 20 times, I don't know, I haven't seen it 20 times, but the first five times I went to visit it, I never read the wall label. The last time I went, I read the wall label. And the wall label said very specifically, don't be fooled by how incredibly sensitive the artist has rendered the suffering of the animals. 
that has nothing to do with the significance of this piece, which is to honor the glory of Azurbanipal, who looks exactly like R2-D2, like a robot. He's going out to kill these lions, and he's killing a lot of lions, like a lot. And they are all in this absolute throes of agony. You can, you really see the suffering in these animals. And I'm thinking, who wrote that wall label? Because I really sincerely think we don't know what the artist was thinking when they made this bas-relief uh, 2,000 years ago or whenever it was. Because I think that you can't deny that the suffering of those animals is clearly apparent. So the animal suffering is something that we can understand no matter what culture we're in. Always. You can just tell. That's what empathy is, especially with animals. Anyway, so I, I really uh, took exception to that wall label. <clears throat> this is the original glass carving into this blue glass, which is based on a photograph of my cat Susie a couple days before she died. A few words about Susie. Susie had no ego. This is a cat that lived with me for many years, and she never, ever asked for anything the whole time. She was such a sweetheart. And she... Um, I, I wanted to commemorate her. She was a dear cat. And here's a close-up. All right, so why do you use glass, Judith? As you can see, I was going to take over the world, but then I saw something shiny. All right, the history of stained glass goes roughly from the majesty of Saint chapelle to horrible little sun catchers. So I don't know why anyone would want to be a stained glass artist in the 21st or even the 20th century. Um, but I will tell you that glass and light, well, glass, the whole point of glass is the light goes through it. I don't think there's any other point to glass. Um, and light is one of those things that I would say is universally a quality that resides in the object that is always attractive. Um, I know I really like darkness too, but I also really like light. So this is like a seasonal affective disorder box. This is a demonstration of phototropic plants growing towards the sun. This is moss, and this is a sun god. There's plenty of sun gods. Yesterday I referenced um, this which I'm going to read to you now um, with this image. So Aldous Huxley, if you are a glass or a metal artist, you have to read this essay. I'm sorry, but there will be a test at the end of the symposium to make sure that you did the requisite reading. I was absolutely shocked to find out about this essay because it's so important to glass and to metalsmiths, but <clears throat> Anyway, I'll, I can tell you if you want to know why Sharon Church thought it might not be popular now, later, privately. So here's a quote from that essay, which has to do with this Paolo Uccello Occhio stained glass window, which I just want to say, I hate it, all right? Religious art has always and everywhere made use of these vision-inducing materials. For Ezekiel, a gem was a stone of fire. Conversely, a flame is a living gem, endowed with all the transporting power that belongs to the precious stone and, to a lesser degree, to polished metal. This transporting power of flame increases in proportion to the depth and extent of the surrounding darkness. The most impressively numinous temples are caverns of twilight in which a few tapers give life to the transporting otherworldly treasures on the altar. Glass is hardly less effective as an inducer of visions than are the natural gems. In certain respects, indeed, it is more effective, yes, for the simple reason that there's more of it. Thanks to glass, a whole building, the Saint Chapelle, for example, <clears throat> the cathedrals of Chartres and Sens, could be turned into something magical and transporting. Thanks to glass, Paolo Uccello, could design a circular jewel 13 feet in diameter, his great window of the resurrection, perhaps the most extraordinary single work of vision-inducing art ever produced. Um, I think Huxley was on mushrooms when he was in this church because if you've seen a ton of stained glass um, rose windows, no, 
just no. But the rest of what he says is awesome. So don't say, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to take away the value of his words. <clears throat> the other reason I do glass is because glass cures ADD, anxiety, and to some extent these other issues that I have. Definitely cures ADD and helps with anxiety. So <clears throat> apropos of glass and light, my work is in light boxes, which is a horrible, sad thing, and a convenience mostly to make them uh, displayable in galleries, so that's a necessary evil. Um, I got a lot of flack from other stained glass artists about how I wasn't putting my work into architecture, and I started to think about where that would be if I were to do it. And um, in Philadelphia, we have the Eastern State Penitentiary. It is a tourist site. It's a historical landmark. It's not an active prison. And they have a artist in residency program. And I ended up making, I proposed 10 windows and I ended up making 17, which was really nuts, and installing them in the cells, which was a very gratifying experience. Now, because it is a, um, historic landmark, you can't install anything in there permanently. So I had to take them out and then retrofit them to be autonomous panels so that they would be in the gallery and that's what they looked like when they were done. But it did all this great stuff that stained glass does in real churches. Um, my proposal had a lot to do with the fact if, if you've never been to Eastern State Penitentiary, I hope you come to Philadelphia and, um, and see it. It is an amazing space. It was designed by Quakers um, to be, it was the first penitentiary in the United States, and the word penitentiary comes from penance. And the idea was that every prisoner would be in solitary confinement, which sounds terrible, but at, the, at that point, they were really just throwing everyone into a room and letting them fight it out, so it was more humane than what came previous to it. And they wanted people to look up at the, the light source and to experience a moment of pen, or more than a moment, they experience a penance and atonement. So each cell is really the shape of a little chapel. It's quite astounding. <clears throat> this piece was for that installation also. And this piece, I wasn't going to make this, this is the second biggest stained glass window I ever made. And the administrator of the site told me I should make a piece for this transom his name's Sean, and I said, Sean, I can't make a piece that big in a year. And he said, but it would be your masterpiece. And I was like, what? And uh, then I went home and I thought, Sean thinks that it would be a masterpiece. So <laughs> I couldn't not try. <laughs> and my original idea was to make a, um, a battle between good and evil. So I was going to pit the seven deadly sins versus the seven cardinal virtues. And there are basically seven separate fights going on in this window. But in reality, I do not actually believe in good and evil as being separated from each other by some line. So it just became a whole big mishmash. Um, it's based loosely on the painting by uh, Bruegel called The Battle of Carnival and Lent. And uh, this is the studio shot. I can't believe I pulled this one off. And here's some uh, loving close-ups. This uh, body in the foreground here with the tapestry pants is from a Matthew Brady photo at Antietam Battleground. I was really like, I need source material. So I was grabbing it from everywhere. And this is sort of the ultimate good versus evil battle in the sky. And just a couple of pieces of uh, pictures of uh, recent work. I do have a vast collection of imagery of beached whales. And you remember the one with the curtain. The, the real technical reason for this curtain has to do with the fact that the glass in the sky was only the, so wide. So I had to come up with some sort of a strategy for, for I'd already made the whale. So uh, I had to figure it out. So I feel like this is like the price is right and you've chosen door number three, environmental collapse. Great job, people. Sorry. <clears throat> and there's a close-up of the whale. 
I, it was originally a, uh, a blue whale, but I turned it into a sperm whale. Sperm whales are definitely better models. They, they, they do agony really well. All right, sorry. And I'll just leave you with this final quote. A work of art is realized when form and content are indistinguishable, when they're in synthesis. In other words, when they fuse. When form predominates, meaning is blunted. When content predominates, interest lags, says Paul Rand. Thank you. And if you came to listen to me twice, thank you, thank you. I'll take questions if you want.